Hallelujah. 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 You may be seated. In 1985, God called us to the United States, and I tell you that when God called us to come here, I had, I had real big uh, uh, ex excuses in my heart why I shouldn't come. I'm from the mission fields, you know, I'm from the place where you send people out to us. You send missionaries out to come and show us in Africa what God really can do. And when God first spoke to me about coming to the United States, I had a real problem in my own heart because I said, God, what should I come and do here? As far as I, I was concerned, the best preachers in all the world is right here in the United States. But when I set foot onto this continent, uh, we were nothing but appalled. I mean, we stood in absolute, utter disdain at what we saw going on in the church. This nation, you know, people ask me all the time, why, when you look at prophecy, is the United States not mentioned in end-time prophecy? And I went to God, asking God about that. And God spoke to my heart and said that the role of this nation is being played out at this end time that this gospel must be preached in all the world. Then shall the end come. We are the gospel center to the rest of the world, but the church is in deep trouble. Put your hand on your heart tonight and ask God to speak to your heart tonight. You know, when I, when I, uh, when I preach, I refuse, I'm telling you, Eddie, uh, I refuse to just go around and preach just for the sake of an offering. I don't want to just go and entertain people with great sermons. My message that I bring to you tonight is the message that God has given me this year for America. And I want you to open up both your ears and your heart. And then when God speaks to you at the end of the service, you need to say to yourself, I'm going to do something about this myself. Put your hand on your heart right now and let's pray. My Father, I pray that heaven indeed will open up freshly around, not here in this church only, but in this great nation. I pray, O oh Lord, that you would grant that a repentant spirit will grab a hold of your people again. I stand before you as a prophet. I stand before you, O oh Lord, as a servant, as a mouthpiece. And as I speak, Lord, I want to speak as you, as you uh, inspire to speak, that I speak no less and no more than what you want me to. For I ask it in the name of Jesus, and we thank you. Amen. Amen. Take your Bibles and turn with me, please, to the book of John chapter 1. John and the first chapter, and we'll start reading in verse 50. How many of you brought your Bibles? Let me see your Bibles. Put them up real high. Bibles, iPads, look at that. Man, there's a great improvement here. That's great. Clap hands for yourself. That's wonderful. <clears throat> I said to my wife, if I ever had to start another church, I would start a church in a different style. I would do it with tables in front of people. so they can write, study. It's time that we study ourselves again to be approved by God. Become word people. Say word people. Come on, say it again. Word people. And I can see you're in that direction. Keep on going. 
At this point in time that we're about to read, Jesus is gathering the disciples around him for the final three and a half years thrust forward. And uh, Philip is bringing to him Nathaniel, and when you read this chapter, you'll find out that Nathaniel was quite surprised when Jesus said, Behold, an Israelite in whom there's no guile. And Nathaniel was surprised. He said, Where do you know me from? Jesus said, I know you when you were still sitting under the fig tree. Is that me? Is that a battery? Give him a chance. Thank you. And Nathaniel, I'm on. Nathaniel was quite impressed. He was impressed. That's one of the problems with people. They are impressed when they see the gifts in operation. People are no longer impressed with God. They're, they're impressed with phenomenons. I'm all for gifts. Don't, don't, don't take me wrong. Don't get me wrong. I believe in the gifts. But that should not be what impresses us. We should become so intrigued again with God that when we're sick, we go to God, we go to church. When we go to church, we should tell our children, when they say, where are we going? We're going to God tonight. We should become God conscious again. Like what Tommy Tenney says, you know, become God chasers. I was at a church in, in uh, and tonight I don't know if I can preach within 40 minutes. You're going to have to just bear with me. Can I take just a little bit of extra time? I'm telling you a forehand right now. It's going to take at least two hours. I'm kidding. <laughs> I was at a church in Oregon a couple of months ago and uh, was supposed to start there on a Friday night. I was there with, on a Wednesday, friends of mine, and they uh, asked me to teach on Wednesday night at their Bible study. They said that they're working through the Bible, and they said that tonight we're dealing with the gifts. I said, where are you reading? He said, 1 Corinthians 12. I said, yeah, but that one doesn't deal with the gifts. He said, yes, 1 Corinthians, Corinthians 12. Yeah, but it doesn't deal with the gifts. He said, Brother Vinti, you got me confused now. Let me get my Bible. He took his Bible out. Get that on the script. On, on, we, can, we can just swap again. Just 1 Corinthians 12. He, uh, do the, the King James, if you will. He opened his Bible. He said, let's, let's just read. He says, um, now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I don't want you to be ignorant. You know, that's how people read the Bible. They rush over you know, the actual points that the Holy Spirit wants you to catch. Now, concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I don't want you to be ignorant, so he read it. He said, you see, it's about the gifts. No, I said, now read it again. Now, read it with me. Say, word for word, say, now, concerning spiritual What do you see about gifts today? What about that word? Why is it in parentheses? It's an added word. 
the Bible translators had to do that many times, you know, because they translate out of a, uh, a rich environment like the ancient languages, Hebrew or Greek, into a young language like English. Oftentimes they have to do that, you know, just to just make some texts a little more clear. That word is added. I said to the pastor, now read that verse again, this time without the added word. Now read it with me. Say, now concerning You understand, it changes, it shifts the focus. 1 Corinthians 12 doesn't deal with the gifts. It deals with spiritual men and women who walk with God. And he just happened to say in the rest of the chapter that these are, and I'm paraphrasing, these are phenomenal, phenomenal people. Whatever they need for the job, God provides. To some, he will give prophecy. Others, he will give, you know, gifts of healing. Others, you know, miracles. Others, word of knowledge. But it's not about the gifts. It's about the men and the women who do great exploits for God. And it's time, I'm telling you right now, it's time that the American uh, church rises up again and where they can realize once again, I can walk with a the, with the peacemaker. I can walk with a creator. I can become a Moses. I can become an Isaiah. I can become a Ze Ezekiel. I can become a Jeremiah. I can become a Daniel. Come on, give God a great praise offering. Somebody shout for him, glory to God. We have become so wrapped up with church and, and the hand-me-downs where we just, you know, sit there like, excuse my expression, but like zombies. Instead of asking God, speak to me, O Lord. Come on, raise your hands, both of them. Say, speak to me, O God. Oh, God. Come on, ask him again. Go ahead and pray in your heavenly language. You pray right now. Go ahead. Make a noise in this house. Fill the atmosphere with prayer. Glory to God. La brosia makahai. Come on, don't stop. Come on, just pray through in the name of Jesus. Glory to God. Wow. Glory to God. Now, go back, please, to John chapter 1 and verse 50. And Nathaniel was impressed because Jesus spoke with a word of knowledge. And then Jesus answered and said to him, Because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, is that why you believe? I mean, is that what impresses you? He says, you will see greater things than these. Come on, say it. Greater things. <laughs> Pastor, a preacher told me last, last week, two weeks ago, he said a man asked him for a word from God. He said, yeah, I do have a word for you from God. He said the man stood with expectation. Well, what is the word? He said, God said, I must tell you, he wants to talk to you personally. <laughs> Do I believe in words? Do I believe in prophecy? Do I believe in all the gifts? 100%. But it's time that we say to ourselves, I want to see greater things. I want to see greater things. I want to see the church come alive again. I want to see the sick healed. I want to see, as I walk into the hospital, people setting free. Come on, give God. A great shout offering glory to God. Somebody shout for him tonight, my God. And then in verse 51, we're talking about greater things. Say greater things. 
And then verse 51. Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Hereafter you will see heaven open. I'm going to talk to you about that tonight. Heaven open. And the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. If there's ever a time when God knows that America needs for God to open up the heavens, it's in the hour in which we live right now. We need a miracle. Come on, can I hear an amen? We need a miracle. We need people to get up from their pews. We need people when they see God does something here up front, that they don't sit in their pews and remain in their pews, but that they rush forward and say, my God, do something in my heart. Do something in my spirit, my God. I don't want to stay at the same place no longer. We want the heavens opened again. Come on, somebody, just praise him. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Now, Glenn, you're doing a great job with that sound system. Come on, clap hands for you. <laughs> All right, well, it's him. Now, just don't move me up and down. When you hear me talk loud, just leave me in one spot there. And I know he's doing that. They're trained well, these guys. They, these are, what's her name? Uh, Joyce Myers men. Let, oh, is that your husband there? No. Larry. Larry's your husband. <laughs> You're the good looking one. How's he doing? Oh, good. You know, as we go around the world, Eddie, we see phenomenal things. You're from Africa? Where? Uganda. You know what I'm talking about. There was a time not long ago, not too many years ago, where when you went to uh, Africa, I want you to hear me tonight. There was a time when you went to Africa you had to literally fight through atmospheres, demonic atmospheres. Still today, in many of those meetings, the heavens are so open. When we go there in one service, it's just in one service, there we could have 20, 30, sometimes 50 people manifest demons and then everyone set free. But for so long, you'd go to Africa, and I'm telling you, it was like fighting the hordes of hell. And then all of a sudden, God decided to open up heaven around Africa. Today, you saw the meetings that we're having, where we go there, it's no strange thing to have meetings with over a million people in every service. And then when they come together, we'll start, sometimes we'll start some of the meetings, my wife was with me in some of those meetings, where we would start, open up the gates, eight o'clock in the morning, and then only allow the very sick people to come in and come and register for uh, classes, healing classes. And then in the evening service, we would have from a half a million upwards of people that come from far and wide for a touch from God because heaven had opened. We would have prayer lines where we would start praying for the sick, 
like four o'clock in the afternoon and we would pray through the entire night until the sun comes up the very next morning, eight o'clock the next morning and not a single soul would leave the place. They are absolutely mesmerized and they are stuck in their places for God. I'm telling you, they will not move. They don't care about food. They sit there in one place. They just want God. And I come here to the United States, and I find people, you have to tread very lightly, not in this church, but you have to tread lightly when you come and preach for longer than an hour, because people will just get up and go. People have become so, so addicted to their own, their own agendas, their own self. It's only about self. It's only what can I get out of this. And so subsequently, it seems like the heavens have just closed above us. Seems like there's a brass ceiling above our prayers. People come to prayer meetings if they do come, and they'll tell you, I cannot seem to get through this ceiling above my head. Well, I want to preach about that tonight, and I want to tell you it's high time that we as a church say, these heavens need to open up again. Come on, give God a praise offering. Glory to God. Here in the States, people don't even know how to handle the, the miracles when they happen. In fact, when you have people receive their, their miracles, chances are they don't even come back to church no more. We've seen a man crawl on his buttocks overseas in Africa. Crawl on his buttocks. I mean, pushing himself forward with his hands like this. 26 miles. Started two weeks before he could get there. Two weeks. Took him two weeks to reach the meeting. Because he had never walked a day in his life. And word got out that God is in the house. God is in the city. Come on, give God a praise offering. Glory to God. I'm telling you. And then when we come to the place, couldn't get anywhere near the prayer line. Sat, sat against the tree and started weeping. And one of the local pastors walked by him wanting to know what's going on. And he said, I came for healing. I can't walk. And the man just touched his, his feet like this said, in the name of Jesus. When he said, in the name of Jesus, God straightened his legs and healed him. And the following night, when the dancers came dancing into the place, he was leading the procession. Come on, give God a praise offering. Ah, somebody shout for Jesus. Oh, Lord. You know, I can tell you so many about so many miracles, and I'm not trying to put you down. I'm just trying to make you jealous. I'm just trying to entice you. I'm trying to remind you of what you used to be like. This nation used to be hungry for God, but we have replaced the hunger with religion. We have replaced the relationship for religion. Let me tell you something. It's high time, and we say to ourselves tonight, my God, show me what I must do to get the heavens to open up around us again because we need the supernatural power of God. Glory to God. You look at the politicians, you look at the world out there, you look at the people in the street. They don't want to come to church, and I'm telling you, I don't blame them. Because most of the churches you go to, you don't feel the presence of God. In fact, it almost seems to me as if, as if, they don't want God to show up. I had a pastor one time. I stopped in, 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 in Nashville. Bessie and I, we stopped. Uh, we were traveling with a bus those days. And, and we had and them working our bus. And a pastor came and stood there next to my bus. And looked up at the name of the, the bus in the back. And then asked me, he said, are you an evangelist? He, I said, Yes. And then he starts telling me about a phenomenon that started to happen in his church, Baptist church. He said, I don't know what it is, 
But he says, when I get to the end of a service, it feels like the place is going to explode like a bomb. So I said, but that's a good problem. <laughs> How do you handle it? He said, he looked around to see that nobody was looking. He said, brother, I don't know how to handle it. He said, the only way I know how to handle it, he said, I, I, I share some humor. I get them to laugh and I get the atmosphere back under control. He said, you think you, you, think you can come and preach me a revival? <laughs> I said, Pastor, you don't even know who I am. He said, you're right. Who are you? So I told him my name. He said, now will you come preach me a revival? <laughs> I told him, I said, you know, it'll have to be late next year. My schedule is jammed back full. If I get a cancellation, I'll call you. No. This was around October. He said, no, I need you now. I took my schedule out. He's over my head, uh, over my shoulder, and I page through. This is full, that's full. And we come to November, we come to December. When we get to December, I get to the week of Christmas. I just page to the next page. He said, whoa, 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 whoa. You got one open there. I said, yeah, but that's Christmas. He said, I'll take it. <laughs> we had such a phenomenal meeting. I don't want to pause and talk about that, but it was just phenomenal. My wife and I were so sick and tired of pastors when they try and book us for a meeting, when they'll say, that's Memorial Day, that's Easter. That's Mother's Day. That's Father's Day. My goodness, you're not hungry. You're not hungry. You don't even know what you need. What we need is to get to a place where we push everything aside. Where we say, my God, we need heaven open. I, I don't need, I don't, I want to get on your schedule, Lord. Not you on my schedule. Whatever it takes, God, please come and move in Granite City. Come on, give God a praise offering. Take your Bibles and go to Leviticus 14. Let me share with you. Leviticus 14, God is speaking to Moses and Aaron, we start in verse 33. God is speaking to Moses and Aaron, and um, he's reminding them that he had given them the promised land. And then in verse 33, the Lord spake to Moses and Aaron, saying, when you be coming to the land of Canaan, which I give to you for a possession, and I put the plague of leprosy in the house of the land of your possession, and he that owns the house shall come and tell the priest, saying, it seems to me, as it were, that there's a plague in the house. Just look at me. I don't want to read the entire chapter because we don't have time. God is saying to them that when you come into the land that I give you, look at somebody say, this is our land. Look at somebody again and say, my house is God's house. Come on, look at somebody again. Tell them. Make these statements. Say, my house is my possession. Whether you rent it, whether you're just having it on loan, whether you own it, 
That's the place where you and God should dwell together. I've always told my children, I don't care what you do in the street, but when you come through that gate, this is the house of God. My family have always known, they still know today, where we stand with God. We do not compromise. We do not look away because of certain celebrities or certain events that are taking place and, you know, they should say, well, this or that. No, when they come onto my property, that's the house of God. One of my sons showed a video in our house one time with cuss words in it. And when I spoke about it, he said, that's ordinary street language. That's how they talk in the street. I said, yes, but this is not the street. This is my house. And me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord together. This is where I want God to feel comfortable. This is where everything happens. It doesn't happen in church. It happens at home. That's the house of God. This is where I want God to come and feel comfortable. I need him to wake me up in the early hours of the morning. I need to have fellowship with him. I need to make sure that their God connects with me and my wife. This is where we can find out what is God saying. What is God instructing us to do? That's the house of God. And God told Moses and Aaron, there will be situations where you come into the house where I will send leprosy into the house. A crawling leprosy. A leprosy that contains hollow streaks of reddish and green. It will go from the lower end of the wall pointing down. God says that when you see leprosy, don't take a chance. When you see any signs that seems to be leprosy, call the man of God. Said there seems to me that there's leprosy in the house. God sent it there. God told them beforehand. When you see leprosy, deal with it. Come on, can I hear an amen? amen? That's the problem. I'm telling you right now, bro, that we can preach until we're blue in the face. And I see that in America. You can preach until you're blue in the face. People will not change. This nation has become a stiff-necked nation. This nation has become a hardened, hard nation. This nation has gotten to a place where they toy and play with the presence of God. Let me tell you something. God is a holy God. God cannot live where sin abides. God cannot have association with you. If you live a double life, if you live a double-minded life, God wants you, if you see there's something going on, you've got to deal with it. I went to the Lord. I said, God, how can you send leprosy? I searched the scriptures to find an answer. Don't find it in the scriptures. Finally found my answer in some of the uh, historical books of Israel. The rabbinical midrash, one of the volumes in the rabbinical midrash came and gave the answer and this is what happened. When the people of Jericho 
heard that the people of God is coming to occupy. They said they can take our land and they can take our homes, but they're not going to get their, lay their hands on our money. So they took their gold and their silver. And when they, they took the gold and silver and melted into small little idols and buried it under the foundation of certain of these homes. Now, when you moved in there, you wouldn't know that it's there. But you have to understand, God is such a jealous God. Come on, I want you to amen that. God is a jealous God. You have to understand that God cannot enter into a place that is unclean. He does not enter into a place that is unclean. See, you understand. Let me just pause. I'll come back to that. A lot of people pray for revival. I have a lot of churches that we go to. They fast and pray for revival. Possibly one of the dumbest things you could ever do. You don't pray for when you're in the winter, you call, it's very cold and, and icy and stormy. And then you get the church together and you have a prayer meeting where you pray for summer. Hello. <laughs> Boy, you're quiet here tonight. You remember my teaching? When, when it's on the wheel, it is going to happen at its time. Boy, I like the way that, you know, when you see people think, they go like this. I preach and I watch some people sit like this. And then, and then when something happens like this, they go. <laughs> you understand? Revival is seasonal. Our thinking should be generational. What does Psalms chapter 1 say? The righteous will bring forth their fruit in due season. Your season cannot come when you are not ready. You understand? That's, that's a, a teaching for another time. You know, that's, we have the Kairos moment. We have a Kronos moment. Kronos moment is what happens in the sequence of time. A Kairos moment is what is created. It's a moment that is created. When everything is in place, God can step in and say, your season has come. But while there are spiritual things in your foundation, things that are wrong, spiritually wrong in the foundation, God cannot allow revival to spring forth because it's like giving birth to babies within a hog pen. Boy, that's crude. I know it's crude. But it's true. It will be infection. In fact, we see people get saved. We see them get saved in the church. I mean, in the street. We see them get saved in under ministries and they come to a church and within months they are spiritually infected. 
They start thinking religion. And God said that when there's something wrong, I will send leprosy in the place. And then when you read the, the rest of that chapter, the only way you could find out that he says it seems, when it seems to you, it could be mildew. I mean, if there's something wrong, it could be mildew. It's not always, you know, the ultimate. It could be mildew. If it's mildew, you can use Clorox. If it's just a slight problem, you can go and see a counselor. You can use bleach. You can even shout it out. <laughs> but not when it's leprosy. When it's leprosy, you've got to go right down to the foundation. Come on, say it with me. Say, we've got to go down to the foundation. There is so much wrong in our nation. People don't even know anymore. And I don't want to be a closet preacher. I don't want to preach about certain things, this and that. But let me tell you something. We're living in a time where people don't even know what is wrong anymore. They don't even know what is sinful anymore. They don't even know what is filthy anymore. It's high time that we get back to God and say, God, we want the heavens opened. Please, Lord, show me what is under my foundation. Go ahead and give God a praise. Oh, I'm telling you, you go into the church, if you go around in the church like I'm doing, you cannot believe what my eyes see. You cannot believe what I have to deal with. And there's children here, so I don't want to go into it. My heart bleeds inside when I preach revival. And revival stays away. And revival seems to be a thousand miles away. And everybody preaches about revival, and it's become like a cliche. It's high time that we say, my God, let our season come. Lord, let our season come. Help us to clean up the foundation of our existence. And whatever is wrong, show us how to fix it up, O oh Lord. Go ahead and praise him. Oh, come on, don't get tired. Just, just worship Our churches, Pentecostal churches, have become spiritually sick. Families come to church in desperate need for help. And they may get, because they may have a pastor that is genuine. They may have some people that are serious. But then there are so many that still remains indifferent. Oh, God, put your hand up and say, oh, God, open up the heavens. Come on, say it again. Open up the heavens. Come on, pray, pray. See, those things that are under the foundation, they create what I call atmospheres. Did you feel the atmosphere tonight when we came in here? How many of you could feel it? How many of you could tell that there was an atmosphere here? Gone. Can you tell? It's gone. See, an atmosphere can be created. Have you ever created an atmosphere? <laughs> she does. We can always create atmospheres. Yes. Have you ever created an atmosphere? No. You know how to do it. <laughs> bad or good, I can do it. Yeah, sometimes bad, sometimes good. We all do. Yes. How many times have you gone to somebody's house and you're good friends with them? And then when you leave, you say to your wife, your husband, did you feel that atmosphere? 
They didn't say a thing. They still smiled. Now, my wife is good at that one. <laughs> I'm kidding. No, I'm not. She can make me know when she's not happy. Boy, women are good at that, aren't they? You come home, you don't know what's going on. They can create it. And you, you, you say, what's going on? Nothing. <laughs> you have. Uh, let me tell you, men. Let me tell you guys something. Women, they're much different from us men. Come on, men. I can give my wife a new car. And she'll say, oh, wow, that's nice. Oh, thank you, honey. Come home with a rose. And I'll tell you what, I'll eat dessert for a week long. <laughs> They're strange creatures. The pastor told me one time, he says, my wife uses everything I give her. You give her something, she uses it. He said, I gave her a, I gave her a blender for Christmas. He says, for the next month, everything we ate came through that blender. <laughs> he said, Christmas morning, we drank a chicken. <laughs> it's like the woman, you know, they know everything too. They know everything. Like the woman that called the husband, she said, uh, you got to come and help me. The car won't start. I think there's water in the carburetor. <laughs> he said, water in the carburetor. <laughs> he said, John, I knew she knew everything with men. You know, that's a little too much. How does she know there's water in the carburetor? He said, I asked her, how do you know there's water in the carburetor? She said, because the car is at the bottom of the lake. <laughs> Atmospheres. Now you understand, you, you have to understand something. Something can happen to you. It could be something somebody did. And if you don't deal with it right away, because once they hurt your feelings, you know, you show it. You create an atmosphere. And if you don't deal with it right away, it becomes what I call a sustained atmosphere. And a sustained atmosphere becomes a climate. Now, you know, there are so many churches you come into, they have so become so used to adverse atmospheres. They have all sorts of issues all the time. And so that atmosphere becomes the climate. Once it becomes climate, the heavens closes up around you. Now, when you sustain an a, a climate long enough, it becomes culture. Now, I want you to understand that this sustained climate of living without the presence of God have become climate in America. I'm telling you, the Bible Belt, as we refer to the Bible Belt, have become a climate and then a culture without God. 
Now, people will say, well, you know, we're two and three. You know that old, old verse that they quote out of Matthew 18, where two and three are gathered. Listen, we're not talking about the omnipresence. We're talking about the omnipresence. Where when you come through those doors, heaven is so open above the place. Nobody talks. They come in and they soak in the presence of God. You don't have to teach them to worship. It's already there inside. They're in the presence of God from the moment they step on the premises because the heavens have opened up around them. Go ahead and give God a great praise offering. Glory to God. Well... Now you understand, that's what we're talking about. We're fighting atmospheres because of what happens under the foundation. God said, you've got to lift those foundations. Now let me tell you what happens. We have it happen all the time. Bob, I'm telling you, I see it all the time. People come and complain to me all the time. They'll come here and they get a touch from God. You can tell they're hungry. I said to my wife, I can tell there's hunger and thirst in this congregation. In fact, we're so happy we came here this week. It was a decision that I had to make. But I'm so glad I made the decision to come. There's a hunger, there's a thirst. But I see people get touched from God, by God. They'll be here on the floor. Some of them will lay here in the meetings, sometimes for a half an hour, sometimes longer. They go home, and then as soon as they go home, they'll tell me, invariably, they'll come back in the week and they'll tell me. They'll say, Brother Venter, we had such a touch from God. But the moment we walked into our home, all hell breaks loose. Sometimes it's not even when they go home. Sometimes it's in the car going home. Sometimes it's in the car coming to church. There's such an adverse situation that's going on. They learn to live with it. More than 65%, now 67%, of all Christian families end up in divorce court at least one time in their lives. Nowadays, it's no strange thing to find them 10 and sometimes 12 times in a divorce court. If you're sitting here and you've been divorced before, please, I'm not trying to drive a dagger into your soul. I'm so sorry you had to go through it. But should you not do something about it? Should you not say, God, open up the heavens around my home. Open up the heavens, open up the heavens around our church. And when you find out that there is leprosy in your home, don't live with it. It will kill you. It will destroy you. It will break your home. It will break your will. It will break your love for God. It will break your desire to worship God. You will spend very little time with God in your home because you are infected by a spiritual leprosy that is crawling up in your soul like a cancer and it will destroy you. And if it doesn't destroy you, it will make you like so many other people, just merely having a form of godliness but have no power of God. Come on, give God a praise offering. Now let me tell you something. People don't know. People live in ignorance. They collect things in their homes that should not be there. You need to go home. You remember what I said to you in the beginning of the service tonight? You need to go home and do something about this.
Go through your video collection. Boy, if ever there's a door that the enemy managed to get open into our homes, then it is through Hollywood. Where people, just for the sake of a good story, will sit there and listen to a story. And no matter what they say or do, they'll tolerate it. You know, even when I was still in the workplace years and years ago, I never could stand it for somebody to use the Lord's name in vain. I remember one time I was working with a guy, and I mean every other word would be Jesus Christ. I talked to him, and I said to him, please, you know, that name means a lot to me. And then he became spiteful, he started using it more. So I went and found out, made it my business to find out what is his wife's name. Mary Robinson. And if I struggled with something, I'd say, Mary Robinson. <laughs> I hurt my finger, I'd say, Mary Robinson. Well, just a little, just a short little while. Uh, he got offended. <laughs> and then he told me so. I said, oh. Well, that's the way I feel about my Savior's name. Yeah. Don't use his name. And if you want to fight, I'll fight you. I love that name. That name is the only hope for this world. The biggest whooping, the biggest whooping I ever put on a man is when he used the MF word on me. Well, I tell you what, I, I whooped him so bad. That's insult. I grew up, listen, today it just seems like people don't even know this, but I grew up, you didn't even say the slightest little crude word in front of a lady. Today, ladies are as foul-mouthed as the men. The computers have just absolutely opened up doors for people, Christians, in their homes to do things that are unthinkable. Behind the scenes. Music, you're allowing your young people to bring music in. They're following and pursuing role models that are so ungodly. And they pay top dollars to bring that music into your home. They boss you around and they want you to understand, that's my music. Yeah, you turkey brain, this is my house. You have to understand, this is my house. It has nothing to do with style. I know, I know their style is different from mine. But whoever you listen to, if you're a child of God, listen to Brother Vinter. You make sure that you look at the lifestyle of the one you're listening to. Some of those words and the lyrics that they use is so ungodly. And just for the sake of a beat, the young people will just pump their ears.
full with ungodly stuff. And then the parents want to wonder after a little while, why are my children so rebellious? It's because you are allowing leprosy in your home. You're allowing that leprosy to just remain. God says, I cannot dwell there. God cannot dwell in an unclean place. It's high time. Come on, church. I'm telling you the truth here tonight. You need to go home. Go and clean your house. I, I want to share this with you quickly. I'm heading f towards the closing. Uh, uh, we had a, a young honeymoon couple in one of our meetings that came years ago. They came to a service on their honeymoon. They came to visit their, their uh, brother, his brother or his sister. And, and then they brought them to church. And that night they got marvelously saved. And then stayed for the entire duration of their honeymoon. And just stayed in the presence of God. And I taught them. And then after 10 days or whatever, they went home 300 miles away to their home where they lived. That first night they called me. I remember his phone call so clear. His voice filled with anguish when he said, Pastor, there's a strange thing in our home. What is it? He said, it's a green eye. This big. It's hanging from the ceiling above our bed. Now I've never had to deal with an eye. <laughs> I've had to deal with a jealous eye. I've had to deal with a guilty eye. I've had to deal with selfish eyes, but I've never had to deal with a green eye. They said, this big. I said, because I didn't know what else to say. It must be something that comes in from outside. No, they said, there's heavy curtains drawn. There's no reflection. Well, I said, just do me a favor. Take a broomstick. Go and touch the eye and tell me what happens. I can hear the chairs just fly. Man comes running up to the phone. Don't ask me to do that again. I said, what happened? He said, when I came close to that eye, it just flared up. Angry looking eye. A demon is what it is, demon. I said, well, let's pray. Prayed. Thing didn't go away. I said, hang up the phone. I'll pray some more. This is the middle of the night. I prayed. Thing didn't go away. Called him. Is that thing still there? Yeah, but it just seems to get madder. So finally, I went to the Lord. God, what is under that foundation? And the Lord showed me a vision. I called him back. I said, I see a vision of your living room. Told him what it looked like. He said, yeah, that's, that's it. I explained to him there's a room divider in there with bookshelves. He says, yeah, that's exactly it. I said, there's three shelves. Yes. There's three or four books on the one shelf. He said, yes. I said, what are those books? He said, oh, they're, they're books that I used to study. Well, what is it about? He said, it's about astrology. I said, who's the author? He said, the author is Lofsang Ramba. Now, I know that most of you have never read any of his books, but Lofsang Ramba, he's dead now. I killed him. Uh, I didn't, I didn't. <laughs> I didn't, this is a joke. Don't report me to the FBI. I didn't kill him. But Lofsang Ramba, the logo on his books was a green eye. Now you have to understand, that eye never bothered them. until they brought a different atmosphere into the home. 
Those of you that watch the Weather Channel, you know what I'm talking about. When you have a cold front moving in, and then you have a warm front meeting that cold front, what is going to happen? Storms. And as you go home tonight, you've got to expect that the enemy will try and fight you. Your young people will try and fight you. I asked that young man, I said, in the bottom shelf, what is in the bottom shelf? He said, oh, that's nothing. No, those are just some playboys and some hustlers. <laughs> you understand? Uh, uh, people just don't know anymore what is leprosy and what is mildew. So I told you last night, you know, the lady that called me and wanted this and that. You know, where in the world would you get anybody that would, in their right mind, even think about doing something like this? But that's the church. That's what's going on. What we need is we need a divine, supernatural, spectacular. Give me some soft music. I want some soft music. Uh, we will need something, something phenomenal again. We need to let Granite City, we need to let Illinois, we need to let Missouri uh, uh, take note. Uh, word has to get out. Something has broken loose in that church there at Granite City. People need to flock here and find out. Pastors need to come and ask Larry, what's going on? How did all this happen? And all he needs to do is just to say, oh, from the moment that we cleaned house, from the moment that we set ourselves right, Oh, the righteous will bring forth their fruit in their due season. Come on, give God a great praise offering. Stand on your feet and give God a praise offering. Glory to God. Oh, come on, don't stop. Just praise him. Just praise him. Oh, Jesus. Glory to God. Don't stop. Come on, don't stop. Just praise him. Hallelujah. Take this away from me. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Raise your hands towards heaven and start praying in your heavenly language. Come on, pray. Fill the atmosphere with prayer. Go ahead right now. Just fill this house. Let it be loud. Let it be loud. Hallelujah. 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 Stop. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, no stop. Just pray, 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 church. Come on, come on. I want, I want you to pray like you've never prayed before. La mokuya basaka hai, la khatriya sokola mabai, mandoi, bestai, lemdoi, maste, bertakai, restoi, mandre, istokalama, bondra, mastoloriba, bendra masiakoi. Come on, pray, 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 church. Pray, child of God. Pray, intercessors. La stoke, lematoi baba. La basta la maba bohonda, la kia soro kohoi, hallelujah, hallelujah, rabosia kahai, hallelujah, cabra solo maka. Thank you, Jesus. Play me the music. Sabria Soloma Bakahai. Lestoi Makai. Thank you, Jesus. 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 Come on, just Listen, listen, just do me a favor. Tonight, let's do things a little different. Just get out of your pew, out of your seat. Just walk around in the place, pray. Come on, let's fill this, this house with prayer. Everybody, just come out of your seat. 
even if you're a visitor, you're, a, you're, you're, you're aware of what I'm preaching about. Go ahead. Just walk around in the house. Fill the house with prayer. Lambostiki, Lambrostaba, Lengeste, Labriosokoi Makai, Le Kariahostiki Lamai, Lamroya Bostakalama, Landrostiki, Hallelujah, 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 Hallelujah. Glory to God, Glory to God. Bring it louder, Glenn. Thank you, Jesus. Sabroste ma, melimasto kuliba. Thank you, Jesus. 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 Hallelujah. Homagwams. Hallelujah. 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 Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Church is going to take warfare prayers. Just walk and pray. Nobody talk. Tamoshte. Lefstoria Kasumu. Thank you, Jesus. 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 Just learn to wait on God. Just, just a minute, just a minute. Just learn to wait on God. I will pray with you, honey. I will pray with you. Just try something. Right there where you are. Just go and lay down flat on your face. If you can. If it's at all possible. Just stretch yourself out before God on your face. Just soak for a while. Just soak. Just Hallelujah. Bring me up. Bring me up a little bit, yes. Bring me up a little bit. Thank you, Jesus. That's right, just soak. Don't be afraid to lay down before the Lord if you can. Just try it. It's the utmost position of humbleness. And just tell him. I bring you me. Bring it up a little bit plain. Thank you, Jesus. Bring it loud. I want it nice and loud. More. 